Welcome everybody to Radicalize Truth Survives episode 105. We are going to be introducing you to a British philosopher named Vlad Vexler. He was born in Soviet Moscow and he has a profound understanding of how disinformation works. He also knows that the West is having a crisis of trust right now and offers incredible solutions on how we can heal our divides. I grew up in the USSR and there the propaganda you got was alternate reality propaganda. My school told me to love Lenin more than my parents. This was falsehood peddled at you designed to persuade you of a coherent alternate picture of reality. This is very different to Russian propaganda. Russian propaganda is not alternate reality propaganda. Russian propaganda is post-truth propaganda. Is designed to persuade you not into an opinion but into inaction, into not doing politics. Russian propaganda asks you to not have political opinions but it wants you to have two minimal opinions about political opinions. First, participating in politics is a bad idea, only a fool does that. Private freedom is good but public freedom is for idiots. Vlad, thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. Uh, when my friend Alex Alvarova sent me one of your latest videos, I reached out immediately because um, in America, there is still a huge denial about active measures, hybrid warfare, the Russia, Russia, Russia propaganda coming out of Trump and Trump's orbit was very effective propaganda. So there's this denial, even though we have a Senate intelligence report. We just had a, a report in Rolling Stone days ago. I've, I've done a whole series on the 2016 election attack. And um, we bring people like you on to help us get past that, to help people understand that narrative warfare is real and that often we're being, through social media and various other outlets, push to the left and push further to the right. And can you just uh, brief our audience on your background and how you came to be somebody who really gets this messaging out to a pretty broad audience? So I'm a British political philosopher um, and I'm writing a book about political freedom. I'm living with a disability, quite a significant one, which means that I'm not attached to a university at the moment. And then my second hat is to be a minor public intellectual communicating mostly on YouTube, sometimes on the radio. And um, my commentaries for the general public have gathered about 30 million views in the last um, year or two, mostly focusing on the challenges Western democracies face, but also on the challenge that uh, the Putin regime presents really to us all, uh, but in particular to folks who are worried about keeping their democracies. Oh, thank you so much for that. And if you could summarize, we have a global audience. Uh, much of our viewership is in the US. If you can summarize the challenges that Putin's regime uh, means to Western nations, what would you say to people? I would say to go very slow trying to conceptualize this because there are two things going on simultaneously and it's hard to pull them apart. One thing is that our democracies are coming out of the bay and going into open water. Now that shouldn't freak us out in my view beyond a certain measure because democracies can sustain themselves in crisis for a long time without collapsing. But that is in part an organic process. We have an extraordinarily deep crisis of trust. I think the deepest crisis of trust that certainly if you talk about Europe, that Europeans have experienced since the revolutions of 1848, not to say the biggest political crisis, we've had much worse, but at the level of trust, we're really in historic territory, almost historically unprecedented territory. And at the same time, 
regimes like the Russians and the Chinese, we're going to focus on the Russians today, are trying to take advantage of our vulnerability. Now, what's difficult about this is that most of what they are doing is about plugging into what already divides us to what we are already getting toxic with each other about and then trying to make it worse. And that creates an enormous headache for us, which is figuring out how much of this is us and how much of this is malign foreign interference. So there's a kind of a double threat that Russian propaganda poses to us. The first is if you like the threat of the interference itself, but the second threat is that we might get divided about the nature of the interference. That's to say that we might respond to the interference by quarreling with each other about it in a way that might be even more damaging than the interference itself. And so there is this extraordinarily uh, smart trick to this intervention in our democracies, which is that our reaction to the intervention might do more damage to us than the intervention itself. But that, it seems to me, is actually intentionally a part of what they're trying to do. The way I would canvas this in terms of ideology, right, which is roughly what sort of stuff's going on in the heads of these people at the top of that regime in the Kremlin, is that they believe in a kind of reverse version of Fukuyamianism. I mean, in the late 1980s, we were the more naive amongst us or the more hopeful amongst us, contemplating whether we might not converge on some kind of species-wide civilization expressed in a particular model of democratic capitalism. The Russians have a teleological story going the other way. That's to say they think that the collapse of democracy is inevitable, partly because they think that it was never real. It's just a narrative these Westerners tell themselves. And in fact, all of their fancy democratic dances, like their talk about relationships of opposition that are different to simply being enemies, all of that is just froth atop a glass that either will blow off itself or can be sped up in being blown off by a little bit of a push, a little bit of a nudge here um, and there. So against the background of this interference, which we should be objective about, but not overestimate, they have this theory about our inexorable uh, decline, which is false, um, despite our challenges. It's false. But their belief in it is sincere, and I think that that does structure some of how they look at what's going to happen in Western societies over the next 10, 20 years. How much do you feel uh, that Alexander Dugin has an influence, not just in Russia, but also on the fascist movements that we are seeing appear globally. Dugin is playing uh, two very interesting games. The first game he is playing is to try to leverage his influence in the West his reputation in the West inside Russia. Inside Russia, he doesn't have much of a reputation, contrary to what much of the press says. He's not Putin's brain. He fantasizes about spending time with Putin. He doesn't really have direct access to Putin. And Putin has a rather mocking attitude towards Mr. Dugin and Mr. Prakhanov, uh, a, a certain kind of... Um, spiritual ally of Dugin's. So Dugin has a reputation in the West, and he uses that uh, to gain traction inside Russia. Gaining traction inside Russia, he then tries to gain further traction in the West. It's a very paradoxical situation, but in many ways, Dugin is a bigger hero in the West than in Russia. The second thing that Dugin is doing is that he is anticipating where the regime might go and positioning himself to wait in that place. Uh, he is behaving like a very intelligent, if you like, political entrepreneur, surfing the waves of historical moment of moment, 
and making it look like he is uh, engaged in thought leadership of a somewhat fascistized kind, but in fact he isn't. He is uh, preemptively following the Kremlin by trying to map out the route and then get ahead of get ahead of them on it by a couple of stops. So it's a very fascinating situation because on the one hand, Dugin is waiting for the Putin regime. Dugin is waiting for the Putin regime to arrive where it's likely to arrive in the next few years, but he's not doing that because he's leading anything. He's doing that because he's trying to um, engineer himself into a place that just thinks through the situation as it's developing a couple of steps ahead. So he is an extraordinarily gifted political entrepreneur. There's two things I, I, I want to ask you about that. In, in your first answer, you said that he uses his fame in the West to gain traction in Russia and then uses his fame in Russia to gain traction in the West. That seems very much like he's creating his own feedback loop, which elevates his platform and gains him notoriety. Does that sound like a fair assessment? It sounds like a fair assessment, but the weight um, of impact, I think, is primarily in the West. We take him more seriously than he's taken seriously in Russia. He is trying to rectify this um, relentlessly. Um, and we will see how far he succeeds. But uh, his primary sort of claim to seriousness is the Western myth that he is important in Russia. <laughs> and he's trying to live off that myth while in fact having very little access and very little influence. And that is something he's uh, trying to change. The problem is that uh, the tyrant in the Kremlin, Mr. Putin, is rather inclined toward mystical ideas, rather inclined toward the occult, yeah. but he is very anti-intellectual. I mean, the idea that he could tolerate more than five minutes of a Dugin lecture is just not plausible. Um, so that's, I think, part of the issue. Having said all of this, um, you know, fabrication sustained long enough become reality. So if we suddenly got access to Mr. Dugan's contact list, I would not be surprised if a lot of the European hard right appeared there. So oh, that yes. is true too, and I don't want to deny that. Wow, thank you for that. Thank you both for that. I want to go back to elections since that is something that we are facing here in November um, and and you know it's you know likely the most important election um, you know arguably in history maybe uh, obviously since the Civil War um, and I think it's very meaningful for the rest of the world too not just America but Timothy Snyder who wrote a book called On Tyranny um, I transcribed an interview he did where I transcribed the raw notes from a frontline interview. And he writes that the idea that elections could be real uh, to Putin is a threat. Putin needs Russians to believe that elections are always a circus, a farce and a fake, because if Russians believe that British elections and German elections and American elections are also fake, they're not going to mind their own elections are fake. Do you agree that uh, part of what Putin's regime does is try to uh, help, as you were saying, exploit our division, exploit our vulnerabilities, so our elections do become something that uh, becomes a circus. And as we saw, you know, from the previous election in 2020, in January 6th, it was, you know, we we looked like, uh, you know, we looked um, terrible on the world stage and. I believe that, you know, that that was in part by design. But any thoughts on that, on how it's important for Putin's regime that people in his own country look out at the Western elections and think it's a circus and think it's a farce? I think 
Tim's going in the right direction with that thought. I think where Tim is going is toward the idea that regime security is a very central motivation for Putin's foreign policy. There is a tendency to think in international relations realist circles that Putin is primarily concerned with national security. And I think that a conception of national security that is quite weird and mystical does play a part in Putin's foreign escalation. But at least half of the motivation of that regime is about regime security and preserving power. And one of the things that we are seeing in Ukraine is Putin understanding that an independent Ukraine with moderately functional democratic institutions, even without membership of any Western alliance, is an existential threat to him. Because he thinks that Belarus 2020 could be Russia 2027. If that becomes Russia 2027, then having a, a neighboring democracy um, on the border with some of its citizens even speaking the same language uh, would constitute an existential threat to uh, not just his power, but to his body physically. So I would argue that democracy in Ukraine is perceived by Putin as an existential threat to his power. Then the question arises, does he even believe in democracy at all? And I think one of my previous answers suggested that he doesn't. So his view about that danger that Ukraine might pose would be a bit conflicted. He would partly be worried about a society that's free beyond a certain point, but he would also think that that kind of freedom isn't really possible and it's, it's just a, a sort of a mask covering up the projection of US imperial power. When it comes to uh, Western democracies, I do think that Putin is convinced that some of the stories we tell ourselves are simply bogus. One of the things that I think Putin doesn't really believe in is the idea of political opposition. He believes that all political relationships are relationships of friend and foe. And when we talk about being political opponents, toward each other. And by that, we mean that we are, in virtue of being opponents, engaged in an act of cooperation. That being opponents means that we're opponents on one issue, but could be uh, allies on another. All of that, I think, Putin, to, to, to a good extent, uh, disbelieves. And that leads him to particular views about the uh, medium-term weakness of Western democracies. Now, back back a little bit more sharply to your question, um, I think there are two things going on there. The first thing that's going on is regime security. So you're quite right that Putin is interested in telling the story to Russians that there is no democracy anywhere and asphyxiating democracy on Russia's border in Ukraine. That's the regime security story. But there's a second story, which is to do with, I think, some of the more mystical thinking you find in that regime. And that is to do with elevating Russia somehow from the back row of nations in a single swoop right to the front by overturning a seemingly powerful Western hegemony that in fact is much more fragile and hollow than it seems. So um, despite this emphasis on regime security, there is also this intent, I feel, toward escalation based on some mystical thinking about uh, Russia's historical mission. Wow. This is a perfect place um, for us to ask you uh, to kind of walk our viewers a bit through the differences between Russian and Soviet era propaganda, the video that we opened with. Can you sort of give us some highlights on why uh, that was an important video to make? Well, I think that we in the West are still struggling very much in conceptualizing what we might call post-truth politics. We're very good on the distinction between lies and 
truth. So we're quite good at saying, well, this politician has lied 77 times last month. But what we struggle with is if politics goes out of its way, not just to lie, but to break down the distinction between truth and lies altogether. And that's a real problem for us. Um, we face this in our own democracies because we're increasingly dealing with post-truth populists who are out to break the democratic game. But this post-truth politics is expressed perhaps in the most dramatic way in Kremlin propaganda. So it's different from Soviet propaganda because Soviet propaganda, very roughly speaking, lied or at least gave you sincere falsehoods trying to paint an alternate picture of reality and tell you to believe in it. And if you didn't, it would force you. And if you are not in 1950, but in 1985, it wouldn't force you. It would just tell you to please not challenge it too strongly because you have to pretend that this story still makes sense, even though we all know that we've um, lost faith in it. Interesting. There is no alternate reality that... Now, there's a qualification to what I'm saying, but there's no alternate reality that the Putin regime pushes. It doesn't want you to believe in any particular story that anyone is telling, including the propaganda itself. A tenant of Russian propaganda is, don't believe us either. Yeah. Who knows? We might be, uh, you know, pulling your leg, but everybody else probably is too. So what this starts with is really this idea of taking advantage of an instinct we all have not to be duped and taking advantage of it in such a way that we begin to distrust everything including the very possibility of making any differentiation between truth and lies in general and that of course leads you to a radically depoliticized position because if you look at politics and you have no epistemic orientation at all, you can't say what's true, what's false, then you're tempted to just step out of it. And historically, though this has been changing more recently in Russia, and historically, this has been a very key precondition for the sustenance of these sorts of authoritarian regimes who want to give you a modicum of private freedom, but confiscate from you all public freedom. And then I think there are a few perhaps less interesting, but still worth mentioning tenants to Russian propaganda on top of this breakage of the difference between truth and lies. One element is, which is perhaps just an extension of the point I've made, is a giving up on internal consistency. So they're comfortable to say two incompatible things on the same day about the same event. The third element, which I think is a bit more interesting, is what I call flooding or volume. And that's to say that they're keener on giving you eight incompatible stories about the same event than two. And the feeling is that if you get eight, you really get epistemically disorientated and are really inclined to say, well, if that's what it takes to make sense of this unintelligible world, I'm simply uh, going to uh, uh, give up on it. So basic, the basic distinction is that there's a post-truth story, which invites you to doubt everything, uh, and that's Russian propaganda. Soviet propaganda does give you an alternate ideological picture of reality and wants you to believe in it to the exclusion of other things. Yeah. So the aim is persuasion with Soviet propaganda. With Russian propaganda, the aim is depoliticization, uh, the generation of apathy and confusion. Thank you so much for that. I have a friend um, in Russia who tells me that everybody just watches game shows all day. And that terrifies me. And that's obviously just a you know, broad brush statement, but it terrifies me because I've seen people in my life and in my world become depoliticized, become uninterested in voting because they don't know what to believe anymore. And I think the the most obvious thing that's happened in America in, you know, uh, certainly since 2018 is that we don't have a shared narrative of truth. We don't, we don't, we don't have that place that we go where we all come together 
in that middle place where we understand what happened. And I would love your opinion on Trump's ear, because I look at that where we don't know the facts. There was just a shooting. We don't know the facts of what happened to Trump's ear. And to me, that becomes circus and spectacle. And how do we not know weeks after a shooting what happened to this man's ear? And for me, that feels like the madness uh, that you're describing in either so many different stories or one story or no story to the point where the madness is enough just to turn people away from even trying to engage. So I'm not going to comment on Trump's ear. I'm not going to challenge the conventional narrative. But I think that what I will do is say something broad, which is that you're absolutely right, that large scale democratic societies today have simply lost the capacity to agree on demonstrable matters of fact. And that's a very painful situation, because if, like me, you think that in the long run, democracies only sustain themselves if they are somewhat tethered to truthfulness, if they're somewhat tethered to the capacity for a collective conversation involving truthful critique, then they tend to spin out of control over time. We can sustain this for a decade or two in the cases of most Western democracies simply because of the resilience of institutions. They're getting battered, but they're holding out. They can't hold out indefinitely, um, but they won't collapse you know, from one year to the next. But you're quite right that we have this extraordinary problem of not being able to agree on facts. And that has, I think, a special consequence for how we relate to our institutions, actually. And that's that, I think, in the 1980s and the 1990s, for the first decade of this century, too, you could absolutely identify in citizens what I label as sort of three distinct emotions of democratic distrust. Folks feeling unsafe because they find their institutions incompetent. Folks feeling powerless because they feel, oh my word, there's just no way to inflect this political process. Nothing I do can possibly make a difference. And then folks feeling betrayed, uh, rightly or wrongly, concluding that their political representatives are favoring some outsiders out there um, at the expense of, um, let's say, the majority of citizens. And that can lead to outrage. That can lead to the perception of uh political representatives as evil indeed. All of that is worse now, but it was there before. But there is something that's new here, which is a word that I have partly stolen from the beautiful Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, and that is the word opacity. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very important word for me because what I mean by it, and I think what Chuck Taylor means by it too, is this idea that you look out onto your political institutions and they don't make sense anymore. So you've lost the capacity to empirically and factually understand what is going on in your political institutions. It's like you're looking at a game of sport, but it's not any longer one sport being played, but six or seven. And you're seeing cricket bats, tennis, squash rackets, people doing different things, and it doesn't make sense. So there is this feeling of unintelligibility when you look out into your politics. And that for me is far more scary than betrayal, powerlessness, and safety, because the sense that you can try to look at your political institutions, but then you can't see anything that makes sense, leads you into lapsing into magical thinking, into thinking about your politics completely outside of cause and effect, which makes you extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily vulnerable to a politics um, like the politics of Trump that invites you into proposals that might be appealing, but as you find them appealing, you have absolutely no idea of um, what they mean in practice. You think about them completely outside of cause and effect. You've completely stepped out of thought like um, 
which political representative is going to do what and how and when and by which mechanisms and with which degree of success and so on. so you've completely stopped thinking in causal terms about politics um you've lapsed out of that uh, you're in the realm of uh, magical thinking and what i'm trying to say is that that is understandable for intelligent citizens it's not simply the case that we've become fools and without falling for something that uh, is only happening to us because we're terribly naive. It's not because we're stupid that this is happening. It's because there is a systemic crisis of trust. And that's why our conversation about disinformation needs to proceed very sensitively. Much of what we call out as disinformation is in fact an expression of a deep crisis of trust. And when the Russians are interfering in our societies, they are trying to deepen that crisis of trust. That's much more important to them than seeding a little bit of extra disinformation. And so one of the challenges of our war on disinformation, if you like, is that it comes with the risk that we simply tell each other to get rational and to get serious and to wake up. And that, I think, misses the fact that our problems are much more systemic and that our crisis of trust has real causes that are more structural than just um, a, a loss of rationality or a loss of intellectual seriousness. That was a mic drop. High five. You use three words that I'd like to discuss with you in the context of something greater. We use the word reality, right? And reality is just the shared truth of the group, right? And then you use the word truth. And maybe it's just because I'm a skeptical technology guy, but it seems to me that everyone has their own subjective truth. Like what is true to that person may not be true to other persons. But you also use the word facts and fact is something I can get behind because fact is concrete. A fact is a fact. It is a fact that Donald Trump was found liable for rape in a court of law. It is a fact that on January 6th, Donald Trump attempted a coup. These are simply facts, right? In the realm of cognitive warfare, which is what is occurring globally, right? People's thoughts, opinions, their truths are being shifted by propaganda, whether that propaganda be internal uh, to a country by their own people or external from a foreign interfere, right? How do we make people aware globally that they are under attack in cognitive warfare and that they must stick to facts to form their opinions. So the worry I have about that question is that it takes us in the direction of epistemic education. And that is something that I believe in but I also believe in its limits. I think the three of us could sit here and epistemically educate ourselves. We could talk to each other about our blind spots. We could talk to each other about how we are more sensitive to certain facts rather than others. And if we do this long enough, all three of us could potentially help each other. But as the crisis of trust we are facing is not an intellectual crisis, um, it's a crisis that is to do with social forces, right? Uh, we have various breakages of social bonds in our societies, untethering of social bonds. We have certain kinds of systemic inequality. We have new psychic ideologies of self-realization that prevent us from dealing with each other in terms of the public good and in terms of solidarity. We have this, the disinhibiting and polarizing uh, technological predicament of the internet. So there is a limit to how far we can improve our epistemic education uh, while we are under these systemic pressures. So while improving our epistemic skills is really important, getting educated is really important, uh, 
that will never be as significant uh, um, uh, of a healing step as engaging in democratic regeneration, making our democracies more robust and making citizens feel like they have more oxygen. You see, if you come with the question you've just come at uh, me, a question I like, if you come at, with that question at a Trump voter, um, you'll get into trouble. Mm -hmm. You'll get into trouble because their main problem might be something like feeling a loss of political agency, mm -hmm. feeling completely asphyxiated, feeling completely unheard. And it's only if you, if you like, give them more democracy, we can talk about what that might mean, let them breathe a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, that they are then going to be capable of having a less allergic relationship with truth. Because one of the things I very boldly say is that we have a social crisis whereby truth is incompatible with a sense of political agency for a lot of people. So having put the skeptical thing on the table, of course, there's enormous value in the concern that you've put forward about how we improve our epistemic uh, skills. And indeed, having just uh, sort of talked about the limitations of your question, I must say that my own approach is one that very much centers your question and very much engages uh, with citizens um, in a sort of a long distance conversation that is about building trust and building epistemic skills, which is why finally and I have two channels on YouTube. One presents somewhat more polished essays but the other is just a room where I sit with a phone, record, unedited, and come back day after day after day after day with the same community, very small number of people, a few tens of thousands of people only, smaller than on the main channel. And we look afresh over and over and over at the same, at the same question. And the point isn't that we are debating issues. The point is that we are... Uh, cultivating a, a, a space where people can explore themselves and the world around them uh, uh, epistemically in, in a freer way. So that matters. And quite literally having a very simple conversation about what truth might be and what facts are is also really important. Um, one of the troubling things in our society is that we tend to think that either we need a scientific explanation of something or it must be subjective. We tend to be very bad at what we could call interpretation, right? I mean, I have just told you two things about the Putin regime, that it's obsessed with regime security and that it is on a certain kind of mission of escalation uh, backed up by mystical ideas about Russia's place in history. None of these two claims are factual. They they refer to some facts, but they're not factual claims. They're interpretations. They're interpretations based on insight, intuition, experience, and they are out there to be challenged and debated. And we tend to worry that anything that is an interpretation must be... Um, just kind of uh, uh, a, 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 a flight of fancy and cannot be objective. Um, so we we need to do better in making these distinctions, right? Uh, between something that might be a hard scientific fact on the one hand, and on the other hand, something that's a subjective disposition. There's an ocean in between. And even when we get into facts, there's an ocean of difference between certain kinds of facts and others. So, for instance, nobody would dispute the fact that two armies are now fighting in Eastern Europe. In fact, somebody would, because they might say several armies are involved. So even that is controversial. But if all three of us sat here and said what we probably believe has happened, which is that Russia invaded Ukraine, the Kremlin wouldn't recognize that interpretation. Um, and it, it, it's still tempting for us to call it a fact. So yeah, it is actually a fact, but it's a fact that requires some presuppositions. So some facts are flatter than others, right? Mm -hmm. There are facts that are utterly uncontroversial, that there are tanks on a certain territory. But then, then there are claims that we might take to be factual, 
and they might be factual, but they are factual claims of a much richer kind. For instance, the factual claim that Russia is prosecuting an imperial war, right? Well, what's an imperial war? Is Russia an empire? Well, I'd say that that is on the border of being a fact and an interpretation. But what that shows us is that some facts are flatter than others. Mm -hmm. And um, the trouble is that the types of facts that have become controversial for us are really types of facts that under ideal conditions should be flat enough for us to agree on as part of the crisis we face. That's a little bit of a kind of epistemic swim around in these waters. I found it so fascinating. We have a friend, Adam Sibera, who grew up in um, in the Czech, he, he grew up in the Czech Republic and he uh, is documenting war crimes in Ukraine right now. And he says that he believes that, you know, imperialism is the story that Putin tells when in fact he robbed everything he could out of his own country. And now he goes into other countries to take what he can. And I thought that was very interesting. And I would argue that that is uh, factually based. But again, I appreciate what you're saying here in that, you know, depending on where you're getting your information, you may see that differently. Well, it was the famous conversation at the Treaty of Versailles when the question came up, what will historians say about this? And the answer came back, well, they won't say that Belgium invaded Germany. So there are some basic things that <laughs> yes. we could better agree on. Otherwise, we're going to be in a total mess. <laughs> I so appreciate that. I also have a friend who grew up in Moscow, and he said that one. Of, he now lives in America, and he said one of the things that he wants Americans to know is that this trust that we have that's being eroded is so sacred. And since you've given us this beautiful theme on this systemic crisis of trust, what would you tell people uh, and on how to view trust as sacred and how to heal our own trust? Uh, what is like the best uh, you know thoughts you have on that? Because I think you've hit on something profoundly important. I think that broadly speaking, when trust converts into the sense of um, opacity about political institutions, the best solution to that is to give people the possibility to touch politics and make them feel that politics is real, that it has a certain shape, and that interacting with it is is meaningful. There are all kinds of ways in which we're going to be forced into doing this if we want to keep our democracies. Yeah. And that might mean supplementing our political institutions um, with additional institutions at a more local level, citizens' assemblies, for instance. It might mean certain kinds of decentralization it might sometimes mean electoral reform but we're going to be forced into the realization that some things need to change because yeah. otherwise we're going to fall off the rails but the broad theme here is to make citizens feel that they can touch politics and that they can engage in the kind of feedback mechanism with it um, that as a result of them doing something, something else happens or something else come back, comes back so that they have some regeneration of citizen efficacy. Citizen efficacy is a very important sort of, it's a very hard state to uh, uh, um, generate in our environment, but it's a, it's a very important healing state to work, to work toward. And that's a state whereby a citizen feels that at least on some level they have the capacity to constructively interact with the political system to um you know inflect the uh political process another element of being able to touch politics is the capacity to engage with difference at the local level the capacity to engage with people who vote for very different parties than you do by talking to them and thinking together with them about local issues about which it might be easier to gain common ground and you know um 
come to agreement. Uh, you know, uh, somebody who is drifting into the populist right and a socialist could gain a lot of common ground if they are talking about local speed limits. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a possible, there's always, that we always need to have a conversation of how we reconnect people with politics and how we reconnect people with um, a realistic and sort of a, a non non demonic idea of who else is at the table of politics with them and how you how you have to get along there is also a kind of a progressive fantasy i think that i'm very worried about at the moment and that's the fantasy that you can get to choose who you share the table of politics with and i think sometimes what i call identity politics in overdrive of hyper identity politics invites us to make the case for important causes in a way that appeals to quite narrow values and quite narrow concerns instead of appealing to solidarity or the public good or to a shared sense of fairness or to equality before the law. Um, it, it's worrying for me how much of our progressive politics is trying to advance progressive causes without appealing to um you know certain uh goods and values that all citizens share i think this needs to change and one of the consequences of this is that we pretend we don't have to deal with the people uh, at our table of politics because we could kind of dream them away as though we get to choose how our opponents will be the trouble is that all we are doing is just closing our eyes and our opponents are continuing to sit there and continuing, in fact, to take advantage of us because us pretending that we get to choose whether they're there just leaves them with a better chance of uh, uh, beating us. And uh, that's a very unconstructive way, for example, of, of relating to the Trump phenomena trying to pretend that what's happened is that millions of citizens have become irrational and we should just sit here and wait until our society recalibrates and they regain their rationality well no you have to deal with the actual feelings your political opponents have and as somebody who is deeply connected to the higher education system um at least in 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 the uk one of the worries I have is that we are pushing out into society a generation of young people who are less skilled than they were 10, 20 years ago at engaging in conflict constructively. Um, we have a generation of young people who are at risk of freaking out when they experience conflict and declaring that the other side simply shouldn't be there. Um, and that worries me. And... Uh, you know, I believe that the universities are themselves a very important democratic institution, a very important counter-majoritarian institution, and they need to do more, in my view, to return to that mission of uh, empowering young kids to get out into society and have a robust and realistic and efficacious capacity to conflict constructively and win in politics. I share your concern, and that was beautifully stated. One more from me. Hi-Fi, anything from you, or do you want the final word? You go ahead. I'll take the final word. So I want to know what you think about the fact that Germany has formed a unit to thwart Russian disinformation, and whether or not you think that will be effective, and whether or not you think other Western nations should look at what they're doing. Their government in Berlin is accusing Russia of undermining their democracy. So they are basically uh, putting together a unit that's going to be specifically addressing Russian disinformation. So I think there are two levels of thinking about this issue. One is protecting ourselves from Russian disinformation, from Russian interference. The second is ourselves going on the offense and trying to politicize the Russian space. One of the remarkable things I'm seeing at the moment is that we're doing a little bit of work, very small amount of work, at systematically protecting our democracies from Russian interference. We're doing virtually no work at all 
to politicize the Russian space. I mean, I joke that we have half a strategy toward the Ukraine war yeah. and no Russia policy at all. <laughs> I mean, we literally barely have a Russia right. policy right. while declaring that we are at war with them. And a Russia policy isn't a very complex thing. It's just saying what is in our interests to happen on that space over the next 10, 20 years? And can we do some things that are likely to be only of very limited efficacy to increase the chances of that happening? Um, so absolutely, we should be able to engage against uh, the Russians informationally in the offensive sense. And we should be able to think about that more. There are people thinking about that, Peter Pomeranza, for example, but we're not doing that thought uh, uh, and we're not doing enough of that thinking, let alone of that doing. In terms of protecting us from uh, Russian interference, I think this is very, very important. And we are doing about 10 to 20 percent of what needs to be done. However, we also need to be careful that we don't get overly ideological and insert into our enterprises of protecting ourselves from Russian interference, um, uh, internal domestic political disputes. And th th this means that we've got to be really disciplined. This means, for instance, that when we debunk certain facts, we should just debunk those facts and not go further not add something else that is a more controversial story that then might divide us and indeed undermine the original debunking. One of the problems of us uh, debunking Russian disinformation is how rapidly we ourselves descend into culture wars about debunking Russian disinformation. So this is a very, very difficult balance and it requires uh, enormous discipline around being hard-nosed about this, but at the same time not engaging in ideological overreach uh, as we do this by, for instance, simply equating our political opponents with uh, Russian interference, which will undermine us. And in fact, that would be one of the things the Russians themselves want us to do. They want us to stop trying to fix our domestic problems by blaming the entirety of the challenges we face on the Russians. So this is these are the murky waters. So it requires a lot of discipline. And one of the things that matters here is, I think, uh, a little bit of transformation that's needed in the journalistic profession, if I may say so. Now, two of the closest people in my life are journalists and mainstream media, so I have enormous compassion for the profession. But one of the things I'm seeing is an institutional incapacity in journalism to deal with this post-truth environment. And very often it's just impossible to blame individual journalists because you can only do this well if institutions take a systematic approach. And at the moment, they're flailing all over the place, either through overreaching in their fact checking or through just having no idea how to respond to um, politicians who flood the information environment with lies or politicians who do post truth. I'll give you a small example from Britain, but you have plenty of this in the United States. We have a post-truth populist here about whom you wrote recently in Byline, Nigel Farage. Now, one of the striking things about Nigel is that he is constantly on the BBC. The BBC gets criticized for this. I think the criticism is not entirely fair because, quite frankly, Farage is not just got a significant chunk of the vote in the recent election, but his demographic is on the way up. However, the problem is that when Farage is platformed on the BBC, he tells 77 lies in 25 minutes and a journalist doesn't know what to do. Because if you say, Nigel, you've spoken for 90 seconds, it's seven lies. Let's spend the next four minutes debunking them. The interview doesn't work. And no journalist can take that responsibility onto themselves. You need an institutional approach about what to do. At the moment, individual journalists who work for institutions are being left out there in the lurch. If you speak to them at dinner, 
they say, oh yeah, I interviewed the guy, he lied 77 times, but how can I insert that poem into the interview itself? It's impossible, otherwise we'd spend 90% of the time with me talking about all the lies he came up with. I don't think that solutions to this are impossible, but they need to be institutional. Literally, the BBC needs to have uh, a document, needs to have a strategy for what happens when a politician tells not two, but 402 lies per week. What do you do? How do you interview them? <laughs> um, how do you report on them? Um, so we need, I think, some new solutions because we're still stuck in the 90s with this. Yes. We're speaking to Nigel Farage as though he were a 1990s politician who throws in the odd lie. And that's not what he does. And we need yeah. a different approach. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yes, I have so much on that. We'll have to bring you back on just journalism. Uh, high fidelity. So I'd like to ask you questions about two quotes from Soviet leaders. And the first quote is uh, by Lenin. And he said, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. And what I, what I think of when I hear this quote is I think of groups like Code Pink, who are now predominantly pro-Russian propaganda and calling for peace in Ukraine and acquiesce to Russia's demands. I think of the anti-war movement in the United States uh, during the Vietnam War that was heavily uh, infiltrated by Russian operatives to cause distress in our nation. How do you feel that Putin is using that idea of controlling the opposition by leading it ourselves in the cognitive warfare that we are experiencing globally? I think he's doing more of this in Russia because in Russia, he is moving back out of the post-truth propaganda I've described and back into Soviet propaganda. He is actually trying to tell all of these people we mentioned who are watching game shows, you can watch game shows for a few more years, but eventually you may need to stand up and be counted for the regime. So um, having engaged in this radical project of depoliticization, he's engaging again now in politicizing the population. This is being done tentatively, um, but the trend is going in that direction. We're seeing it above all in the way the education system is being uh, manipulated in Russia and quite frankly, fascistized in the sense that what young children are being taught is not just war prep, but prep for the idea that war is an end in itself. That's a very different enterprise from um, Soviet ideology, which would always tell you why a particular war is good. Now we're getting the idea that war is, is, is good in itself. In terms of the West, I still believe that because Putin's post-truth propaganda has this feature that I call psychological internality that's to say it doesn't want you to be persuaded of anything new it yeah. wants to start with what you already believe and then manipulate you via that it wants to start with your own ideology whatever that is and then use your own ideology to trick you into lapsing into bingo post-truth uh, politics or into unconstructive and even self-destructive behavior. So um, if this is a form of leading, it is an indirect kind of leading that never challenges what already motivates the particular agents that they're trying to manipulate. Um, they're, they're trying to, to rather... Uh, manipulate the motivations people already have rather than instill new motivations in them. So if you can call that a kind of leadership, then perhaps it is. 
Um, but what it's not is um, it's not an attempt to persuade people that their concerns should be something entirely other than what they are. Um, right. So if you like celery, they're not going to try to persuade you that you need a carrot. They're going to try to persuade you that celery is all you need, but you might want to think differently about what you do with it, right? You don't necessarily just put it in a salad. You could go and beat up your neighbor with it. <laughs> so, But they won't tell you to go beat up your neighbor with, um, with a carrot. What I think um, I, I'm saying here is that there's always emphasis on corruption, exaggeration, redirection of organic political currents in our politics, rather than the creation of new currents which don't yet exist because they don't have faith that they can do that. Uh, maybe they will be able to in the future. But so far, their approach is simply to manipulate us via misdirecting what already motivates us. So if you want to call that a form of uh, <laughs> a form of leadership, then perhaps, but I'd be I'd be tentative about that term, at least in in the case of the main form of their inter interference, because it seems to me it really does start uh, with the idea of, making what's already toxic for us more toxic, making yes. what's already dividing us uh, divide us more. And that is why um, we have got to be disciplined about these judgments we make, about how right. far something is a domestic, organic manifestation right. and how mu much it's a product of malign foreign interference. And the trouble we've got is that it's often both Yes. But we just need to be realistic about how much of which it is in each case. So thank you for that thoughtful answer in this very thoughtful interview. Our friend Kira Giles, who wrote a book called Russia's War on Everybody, calls it the long screwdriver. He said, we have our divisions. We have our issues. We have the things that we have not healed in our own country. And then Russia goes in with the long screwdriver and turns up the volume. That is my new favorite you know, uh, metaphor on this. Yes, high fidelity, final, final quote, final question. So the final question I have, and I found this was utilized as a concern uh, in the 2020 election um, to the point it drove people to violence. But uh, Joseph Stalin once said, I consider it completely unimportant who in the party will vote or how. But what is extraordinarily important is this, who will count the votes and how? And it seems to me that the lack of trust that you discuss in how our votes are counted here in America led to partially uh, the attempted coup on January 6th. Thoughts about that? If you can't see your institutions you simply have no capacity to be epistemically confident uh, about checking out what's really happened. So um, this is really deeper than trying to tell citizens, but come on, look, it's it's this, and then it's that, and then it's and now you've surely you've got it, and then now you can see that you had no case there. Um, no, uh, a, a, a citizen simply feels that even if everything they're seeing adds up, there must be something behind what they're seeing that doesn't add up. And this is the conspiratorial sort of track of um, a citizen who has lost trust. That's to say that they begin to think that what really matters is what they can't see. What really matters is what is invisible. Mm -hmm. And then you sit there showing them more and more and more facts that debunk um, the false claim they're making. But they're saying that your industriousness in making the case so strongly must itself be proof that you're hiding something yes. behind your back. Wow. Wow. 
Thank you for that. We have much work ahead. Thank you so much for this thoughtful conversation on the deep crises of trust and how we heal it. You've given us so much to think about. And before we let you go, is there anything you can tell our viewers about your upcoming book project? Because it sounds like it's going to be very, very uh, vitally important. There may be a book project for the general public. <laughs> the book I mentioned is going to be a book on political freedom, which because of my health condition is going to take a very long time. And it'll feature quite heavily the um, British 20th century essayist Isaiah Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, but the only other thing I want to say to anybody watching is, yes, our democracies are coming out of the bay, but we won't sink. Uh, things will get bumpy, um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to drown. So try to not freak out because the vessels that you are in are in patchy waters, but they're also quite resilient and there are still things that we can do. And it's still possible to talk about the future of our democracies in a way that's at the same time truthful and hopeful. So please don't give up. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us here today. My great pleasure. Be the four central pillars of Russian Putinite propaganda. The first pillar of Putin's propaganda is doubt about truth itself. Here we get to the heart of how this propaganda works. It wants to convert the thirst each human has for truth into resistance to accepting that anything is true. It exploits your desire not to get duped by politics, to get you to doubt everything about politics and eventually doubt the very possibility of acquiring truthful beliefs about politics at all.